Dr. Joe, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Nice to be here with you. Uh, firstly, it's a it's a huge honor having you on. I uh, I first came across your book uh, when I was playing college golf in North Carolina, and it was a real lifesaver in 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 terms of all of the reading material that I was consuming, which was mainly golf material. Um, but when I think when you're really in the thick of things, playing college golf or collegiate golf, uh, the only thing that golf is really just on your mind twenty four seven and I think your book Zen Golf really actually helped me step away from the game and uh, approach it from a, a very different angle. So for all the listeners who haven't um, perhaps heard of, of your work, you, you wrote the, the book uh, Zen Golf, uh, amongst some others. Um, so perhaps if we just touch on Zen Golf, um, how did it come to be and uh, what's your process with the book and, and, and your work with golfers? Well, the the um, exciting thing about Zen golf, uh, ma- the subtitle is Mastering the Mental Game, and that is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the exciting thing about Zen golf, Mastering the Mental Game, is that it came out of lessons that I did. Uh, it came out of stories of my working with golfers at all levels. So it's practical. It's not theory. Um, also I wrote in a particular way and that is uh, bite-sized pieces so that people can go in and get one little lesson rather than a progression that they have to read through the whole thing to get to where they want to go. And, and it's been very gratifying. People have said, as you have said, that after reading it, they've gone back in and reread it at least sections of it many, many times. So, Um, Zen Golf was published in 2002, so we're uh, uh, closing in on 18 years that it's it's been out. Uh, And what's what's also very gratifying is I, I have a lot of students now who are big fans of the book who were not born when it was written. I work with a lot of junior golfers, so um, very exciting. Now, right after Zen Golf came out, I got a um, call from the publisher <clears throat> that uh, Vijay Singh's wife wanted me to get a copy to Vijay because she had she had uh, uh, gotten it. We sent it to their house and she'd gotten it and said, please, this would be great for Vijay. Uh, we talked a little bit at the tournament at Riviera Country Club, the Los Angeles Open. Uh, And he decided he wanted to work with me. And a couple of years later, uh, he was able to um, knock Tiger off the number one spot in the world and achieve number one in the world. And I I was able to do the same thing with Christy Kerr, um, really because of Zen Golf and how practical it is. Mm. Yeah, one one thing that really struck me when reading the book is I I, I wouldn't feel like I had to uh, once I finished it I had to start all over again. I could just flick through the book and then land where my sort of finger took me and then just sort of jump straight into it. And each chapter is like its own little story. Yes, exactly. Um, so when you were talking with players, how 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 did this this material and content of Zen Golf come to be? What what was the what was the influence? Well, I started in golf when I was a teenager, but I didn't have much of a swing because I learned from my father who shot in the low 120s, and I found out later that he didn't keep score that carefully. So <laughs> so I had a very very homemade swing, um, and, and for some reason, I just felt like doing it myself and eschewed lessons, but I... I regret that. I wish that I'd gotten some uh, basic fundamental instruction. So it's always a work in progress. Uh, However, most golfers would say their swing is always a work in progress. Now, uh, I got into Buddhism when I was in um, late teens, early 20s. And uh, to keep in mind the cultural context, that was the late 60s, early 70s in America. So there was a a big, big awareness of uh, Eastern wisdom and Eastern consciousness. Now, 
I was actually teaching at a center using mindfulness uh, for psychology. A student came, and I found out he played on a college golf team. So I said, oh, let's, let's skip out some afternoons and go play golf. And as we played, he said, uh, tell me what my mind is doing out here on the fairways. And, and I said, I'll tell you what your mind is doing if you tell me what my body is doing. So we traded. And he became my, my teaching pro, and I became his sports psychologist, for want of another word. Uh, we stayed close for many, many years. And in fact, he was the first one to invite me as a to teach professionally to at one of his clinics. So that really um, kicked off my career. I taught at his clinics. I taught at clinics at other clubs of friends of mine who heard about what I was doing. And and I, re- I tried to record all of these so that I could, or take notes on all of them. So that was the collection of notes from all the clinics and, and individual lessons that I did over about a 10-year period that I combined into Zen Golf. Oh, amazing. Um, I was going to say, I would touch on the the sort of your, your work with VJ because VJ is obviously was known as uh, one of the most more technical players and, and certainly hard hardest working players. How, how did you take him away from sort of um, being a very technical mindset to perhaps forgetting sort of internal thoughts and dialogues? Well, I, I think this is the key, and that is I don't take people away from what they're doing. I try to use what they're doing and what their personality is and their natural tendency is and, and shape that and channel that energy into something that's more helpful. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the idea is, um, as I said, in, in Zen Golf, because they're practical lessons, people have, a lot of people have told me, you know, I read these chapters, were you in the bushes watching me play or something like that? Because it's, it's exactly what happens with me. So, so it connects with so many people because it is about how the mind runs the body. You know, people ask me how much of the game is mental. And I like to say it's 90% mental and 10% mental. <laughs> because your body, your mind runs every swing that you make. So it's how the mind and body work together. You also can't just play golf with your mind un- unless you're on a video game. Uh, and even then, you're, you're doing something with your hands. It's how your mind runs your body. So the whole point is to have self-awareness without self-consciousness. And to have a kind of unconditional confidence that you believe in yourself, even if you've hit some bad shots. So one of the things with VJ and a lot of other technical golfers, the tendency when they hit a poor shot is to get technical and start to analyze and redo their swing, uh, you know, 100 times during, well, not for VJ, 50 times during the round. But the idea is instead um, understand what got in the way of you making the swing that you've trained so thoroughly up to that point. And if you understand what got in the way, then you you can understand what your mental state was. For example, if uh, one time BJ, I asked BJ, and I've done this with a lot of golfers, you know, he hit it to, he pushed it out to the right. And I said, um, what was your intention on that shot? He said, well, the last thing I did was, I thought was, don't hit it in the water to the left. Well, I said, good job of not going left, but you hit it out of bounds to the right. Right. So instead of focusing on what you don't want to happen, focus on what you do want to happen. And and that was actually one of my first, first lessons with him. He said, hey, I've been out here for uh, years and years. I know where all the bad places are. Mm. And how do I play without trying to worry about the bad places and avoid hitting them? And that was really one of our first lessons. So that has carried through. The whole idea is that the biggest source of interference is worry about outcomes. Mm. And, 
And the response to a worry about outcome is either trying to help the ball go where you do want it to go or, or prevent it, particularly prevent it from where you don't want it to go. And that is manipulation and interference with your natural swing. So by removing those, by giving yourself room to play, picking a target with a lot of room around it, and then making a positive, confident swing towards that, that's going to give you your best results. So that's really the, the essence of Zen golf. It's self-awareness without self-consciousness, and it's, uh, and it's using the PAR approach that I introduced, which is preparation, action, and response to results. That your ideal preparation is um, what I call the three C's, clarity, composure and commitment you have a clear picture where you do want to go you've composed yourself and you you're settled and grounded and centered and then you're committed to the shot and not trying to avoid something but committed to the plan that you made um with with pre-acceptance you accept the full range of results and therefore you can make a commitment yeah, it's it's really interesting the the point you made out with VJ playing on tour. You know, he, he's played obviously the same venues for the last sort of five ten years, and he he knows where all the bad spots are. Um, mm -hmm. But yet, that is the sort of the the subconscious mind actually steering him towards the the bad spots on the golf course. When just on the the other side, he he knows where all the good spots are as well. But it's like don't think of the pink elephant in the room. You you automatically think of the right. pink elephant in the room. Um, exactly. And you, and, and what I've found is sometimes your subconscious sends you there, but most of the time it sends you as far away as possible. Mm. So that if you say, you know, don't hit it in the water on the left, you end up hitting. I actually, I, was, I saw David Toms the other day, uh, and he said, I still remember, um, being out on a, in a pro-am with you 10 years ago where this, there was a lake, this time the lake was on the right, and this guy hooked his shot into the houses on the left, and your, and your response was, good job of not going in the lake. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. That's a... So, so that, it, that's, that was memorable for David for the last 10 years. Uh, it, it's exciting when someone remembers. I see people that I, I might have done a golf clinic Ten years ago, some I, a guy from Houston I ran into, he was out visiting in L.A., and he said, oh, yeah, I attended your golf clinic in 2006, and I still use the techniques you had for breathing and, and being prepared for a shot. Now, that, that's huge for me. Mm. What, 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 what are the, some of the uh, breathing techniques you touched on out of interest? Well, we, I talked about the PAR approach. That's preparation, action, response to results. And a, a clear picture where you do want to go, a commitment to that, and then composure. The composure part is important because um, I remember one of the first things I did with VJ, he was in, in his practice round, and, um, and he was talking with his caddy right up to the last moment before he swung. And, uh, and he didn't hit a good shot. And I said, you got to finish the conversation mm. and get settled and focused. So, so you have your, you make your plan and talk about it and use your thinking mind to prepare for the shot. But then when you're, when you're going to execute, it has to be your instinctive mind. Sometimes I've called it your intuitive mind. I, I like to call it your instinctive mind. And, and that comes when your body and mind are synchronized and you're not thinking about it you're completely in the moment now breathing is important because um, when we're under stress our energy moves up in our body and faster you've never heard anybody say you know yesterday i was really down tight they say i was uptight and that's what happens we get up and we get tight and so all of our energy is up high, and, and, and sometimes we absolutely lose, lose connection of our upper body and lower body when we're making the swing. And, we're, and any good golfer will tell you that the swing, and especially the power in the swing, comes from the ground up, not from the top down. Correct? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Ground up, not top down. So 
you can use your breathing to settle, to quiet your mind and settle your body. And I have an exercise in Zen golf called, it's a chapter called Center of Gravity, where you really imagine that your center of gravity is moving down in your body so that the mass of your weight moves down past your weight, past your thighs, right into the ground. And one of my slogans for, for golfers to say before a shot is, take a breath, full breath and let it go all the way out and sink down and breathe it down, feel the ground. Mm. So you really feel the ground under your feet. And, and, then, and where, where are you farthest from being in your head? Feeling the ground under your feet. As as far from in your head as you can be. Now you're settled, you're centered, you walk slowly into a dress, and the rhythm that you set up as you walk into a dress is the rhythm you're going to swing with. So if you rush into a dress, you're going to rush your swing. Walk slowly into a dress, get settled, get grounded, get comfortable, connect with your target, and send it to the target. And that's another thing that I teach a lot, and that is the difference between hitting at the ball and sending the ball to the target. Mm. Hitting at the ball, the ball becomes the end of your swing. And you see amateur golfers make a beautiful practice swing, and then they step up to the enemy. And they swing it like they're chopping wood. And it's a completely different thing because the first part was making a swing. The second part was hitting at the ball. So you... So I like sending the ball to the target rather than hitting at the ball. Interesting. I um, Just a note on that, My uh, I played in a tournament in England last summer called the Berkshire Trophy, which is, it's it's a very uh, well-established tournament in England, like amateur tournament. And uh, I luckily had my girlfriend uh, caddying for me at the time and she didn't know anything about golf and... She was. She made a real point. She said, "You, you, you're coming across as really heavy in your upper body and mind, and mm. your your ground like, and your feet are just feel extremely light." And she said, "Where are your thoughts? Like, how, how? What do you feel?" And I said, "Well, I, I feel very analytical. Uh, I feel, you know, a lot's going on in the head, and my feel, my feet do feel light." And she said, "Well." flip reverse that try and get really cool exactly she's brilliant yeah she is brilliant and uh she we you know she said you know look how look how high you know you almost got shoes that have got high heels on them she almost said take them off and uh feel the ground uh feel feel the space in between the shots um wonderful yeah brilliant. And, um I, I guess that that was going back to sort of the, the grounded golf yes exactly that's um, great but okay, so perhaps touch on um, a bit more of. So you mentioned in your book, like, what's the difference between thinking mind and intuitive mind? Yes, and and really that, as I said, I I've moved. Intuitive mind was a little bit um, new agey, so I, I've really moved to instinctive mind. Okay. And people know what their instinct in, instincts are. Something that that happens naturally. They're they're ingrained. Uh, and you don't have to think about that. You don't think about what your your instinct isn't something that you think about. So it's really the difference between the analytical mind of thinking, and and I like to say if you're thinking about swinging, if you're thinking about your swing, you're thinking not swinging. Mm. And and that's why I separate out. You use your thinking mind to plan the shot. But then you turn over control to your instinctive mind, and that is trusting your natural mind-body coordination. Okay. Um, so if we expand on that, what, what should the, the ideal mindset really look like, say, uh, before the shot, during the shot, and after the shot? Uh, oh, that's where the PAR approach comes in. Okay. Uh, again, before, during, and after. Preparation, action, response to results. So the preparation is, again, to have a clear picture of a positive target. The instinctive mind runs on images. If you give uh, rather than uh, concepts, for example, if you say, uh, and you were referring to this, yeah. don't go in the lake, the instinctive mind gets the don't part, which is avoid. 
and then it might get the lake image, and it's kind of mixed up. Do you want to go in the lake, or do you want to avoid something? Uh, and so, so we're we, we our our mind and our body are not connected. Whereas, if you say, um, give yourself an image and uh, of a, uh, I'm going to hit a, a a little draw to the right center of the fairway. There's no lake involved there. Mm-hmm. There's nothing but fairway in your picture and a, and a feeling that comes from a shape. And that's what the instinctive mind can relate to. So that's the, that's the ideal mindset is having uh, this clear picture. And then part of the mindset is getting out of your head and upper body, as we were talking about, and breathing down and connecting to the ground so that you feel like The energy is coming from the ground through your legs, your core, your torso. And and I loved um, Paul Azinger described Rory McIlroy's swing. He said his his lower body and core provide the power and his shoulder and and his arms and hands just deliver the message. Mm. Isn't that great? Yeah, he, he he's one of the most stable. But you never ever see him off balance at all, do you? He's so, so, so there's, so it's a mind body set, not just a mindset. Then the action part is a, is swinging without helping or preventing. That's the action part in the flow with rhythm, and uh, <clears throat> and not trying to help it, not trying to prevent it. It's basically swinging with trust. Mm. The response to results, the mindset afterward, well, how much good does it do beating yourself up? Not a whole lot. Uh, Once in a while, if you were sloppy and careless, you can give yourself a little kick in the butt. But basically, the purpose of the response to results is to help you do better on your next preparation. Now, I I do business coaching as well and keynote speaking, and I talk about this uh, in the the business context, and there's a principle from Japan called Kaizen, which is the path of continuous improvement. So you have your plan, that's your preparation, you have your action, you perform, and then your response to results is reflection. Okay, so what was my state of mind like? What was my level of commitment like? Um, what was my choice of clubs and, and what was my plan like? And you review those <clears throat> and use the insights that you got from that to do a better job in your preparation next time. So using this system um, actually lets you improve as you play. Mm. And the ideal, the ideal state of mind afterward is, what can I learn from that rather than how upset can I be? Yeah, it's a, uh, I guess these I call them acronyms or, uh, or, or. Yes, they are acronyms, and you want to. The R part is you want to reinforce your success and learn from your mistakes. Interesting. Yeah, there was we had a. Uh, um, do you know much of Dave Allred's work? The he he worked with Luke Donald, Johnny Wilkinson. He wrote the book The Pressure Principle. Um, he's now working. Well, there, with are, there are a lot of different a lot of different books with a lot of different acronyms. So yeah. you know it, it, it's what it's what works for you and what connects with you. Mm. Yeah, no, he, I was just going to mention he he he's very big of enforcing the good behavior rather than uh, saying you know don't like what you're saying, don't hit it left or don't, uh, or enforcing the bad behavior. You just yes, enforce- that's exactly right. That's why you want to, you want to reinforce that success. So what I have my players after they hit a good shot, I want them instead of saying, you know, most amateurs will say, Oh, that was lucky. Right. You know, or, or they'll diminish it and say, even a, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while. Mm. But, but what you want to say is that's how I always did it. When I, and then and then connect to your process. 
either trust my swing or have a good stake have a good picture of the target or something that in your preparation and action rather than that's always how I always hit it when I do something technically correct so I want to reinforce that process because what happens is subconsciously if you hear yourself say that well that's how I always hit it when I um, when I breathe and trust your your subconscious says oh so I don't have to think about my swing. I just have to breathe and trust, and I'm going to hit a good shot. And it really simplifies the game tremendously. It's like uh, I always find that the, the mental game is, is something which we we do forget about, and we know it it needs work on, but we don't we don't give it the attention or the hours like going to the range or playing eighteen holes. I was wondering what what I, sort of um, yeah. what sort of uh, tips or actionable advice you can offer where or drills where we could perhaps work on our mental state of mind just like we would well i i I couldn't agree with you more it's um it's i try to make it analogous to physical fitness how's your mental fitness um how sharp are you how how much stamina mental stamina do you have because people run out of gas mentally they get exhausted uh, and <clears throat> I've been watching um, some some of the Australian Open tennis, and and they talk about that. They they say you know their their the their physical fitness they're tired, but mentally going five sets and into and tiebreakers and everything they're mentally drained and exhausted. So I asked players. I said, how much time do you work on your physical fitness? They said, well, I'm in the gym. Oh, an hour and a half every day. I said, and how many how many hours do you spend on your mental fitness? And they say, what? Right. What do you mean? None? Okay, so you ask for things that you can do. Well, simple mindfulness practice. And in Zen Golf, I include some techniques. And, and, and I've, I've written a, a number of other books that also include these techniques. Um, and that is working with your breathing, working with mindfulness, uh, knowing where your attention is. Are you in the past? Are you in the future? Or are you paying attention to what's going on now? Then the other th- uh, thing is actually while you're practicing, uh, while you're practicing <clears throat> in putting, short game, the range, full swing, spend time doing your full routine. I can't tell you how many players just hit balls, hit balls, hit balls, and they only do their routine when they're actually playing on the golf course. Practice your routine and your your practice your visualization. Practice visualizing shots. I like people when they're on the range after they've warmed up to play imaginary holes mm. and really picture as vividly as they can the shots they're doing. So you practice your visualization. You practice your breathing in your routine and getting grounded. You and practice your response to results. Work on your post shot routine on the range, and you'll and you'll be able to do it much better when you're playing the course. I think it's a, a really good analogy of of uh, of what you said about you know you you spend say an hour and a half in the gym, you spend four hours on the golf course, and then you. You and just, don't do anything on your mental game except complain. Yeah, and there's yeah exactly. It, it, it's a, you're just, <laughs> which is a negative. Which is a negative. I was going to touch on you in another quote in your book. You said, um, uh, "Pre-play the past or replay the future." What 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 exactly do you mean that uh, to the? If you could just touch on that briefly. Well, I ask people um, if they have a time machine in their backyard. Right. And 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 I haven't had a, a yes answer yet. Uh, <laughs> But um, I said, so, so your body, the location of your body in space is always here. The location of your body in time is always now. So you are always, your body is always in the here and now. But your mind is a time machine. And you can go into the past and you can go into the, into the future. So I think you've actually got them reversed in the way you described it, but it, you replay the past or pre-play the future. Yes, that makes more sense. So replaying the past 
is like watching the same TV show over and over and over again. That wouldn't be very satisfying, would it? But how much time do we spend replaying the past and sometimes a different version of it? We go back into the past and you say, well, if I had only said this, then they would have said that, then I could have said this, then they would have said that. And we spend so much time on something that doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. And, and just thinking about it isn't going to go, isn't going to send you back in time to change the past. So we, we, instead of focusing on the shot that we're about to hit, we're replaying what we did wrong three holes earlier. And second is pre-play the future. Well, if I told you you're never going to see a new TV show, all you're going to see are previews of shows you're never going to (laughs) see, that wouldn't be very very satisfying either. So pre-playing the future is anticipating and and, and guessing what's going to happen, but nobody knows what the future will bring. So you're pre-playing what's going to happen when it has it. It's probably not going to happen that way. And especially people who are very pessimistic and always looking for what the worst thing that could happen. I love this quote that's attributed to Mark Twain. I don't know if he actually said it, but uh, but he said <clears throat> it's attributed. And that is, my life has been a continual series of disasters, most of which never happened. Yeah. So that's pre-playing the future and always – always anticipating the worst, the worst, the worst, the worst. So instead, understand what the possibilities are in the future, learn from the past, but then let them go and focus on what you're doing in the present. And you you said you like this other quote, you must be present to win. Yes, very much. Well, it's like a raffle ticket. That's what's printed on the back of a raffle ticket. The only time when your mind and body can be in the same place at the same time is the present. Mm. And then then they can be coordinated. I so you, you're saying that the sort of ideal mindset is to be so sort of present here and now but then always sort of more future based. Uh no. no. Present here and now that that at if you if you're thinking about the future the point is know that you're thinking about the future rather than fantasizing about it. And if you're thinking about the past, know that you're thinking about the past and trying to learn from it rather than putting yourself back there in a fantasy of what you would have done differently. Mm. You can, the the point is once you've taken both of those, because you you need to look at the future. For example, you're playing a, a, a shot, you're on the tee but you notice that the pin on the green is on the far left side of the green. So understanding that, you aim, you want to target more the right side of the fairway. But if you're thinking about, boy, I can't wait to birdie this hole while you're swinging the driver on the tee, that's not going to work. Yeah, never does. There you go. So that's, that's not getting ahead of yourself, not dwelling on the past, but learning from them and, and using your possibilities for planning, but always coming back to the present for your performance. Mm. Um, that, that brings me on to your, your, another quote, which I love from your other book, uh, Walk in the Woods. Um, the, can, you, can you just tell, tell us the rabbit quote? Yes, it's a, a poem. Um, and this is my latest book. It's not about golf, but of course, it, it's about life, so it applies to that. The Disney company asked my sister and myself to write a book on mindfulness, kindness, and um, appreciating nature using Winnie the Pooh and his friends as characters in the book. Mm. So one of the characters is Rabbit. And and Winnie the Pooh, it's a day in the life of Winnie the Pooh, 16 little stories. And the stories are really written for adults to share with children. They're not just kitty stories. They're really for adults to share with children. And at the end of each chapter are adult mindfulness and um, practice instructions. So they're for adults to practice and then share with their children as age appropriate. Now, Rabbit is one of the characters and is very, very busy. And this chapter is about multitasking. So I wrote a poem for Rabbit. 
Rabbit gets in quite a stew, always has so much to do. If he did things one by one, he would have a lot more fun. And then in parentheses, and maybe even get more done. Mm. So when we multitask and try to do many things at once, it actually interferes with our performance. The idea is to do things in a step-by-step fashion and finish what you're doing before you start on the next. Obviously, it applies to golf that we have to perform our swing. We have to play our tee shot before we think about whether we're going to hold the putt for birdie or not. I was thinking of it as well. Say if you if you're playing a round of golf and you've got off to a poor start, but then say you know the the eighth hole or the ninth hole is an easy par five, and when you get to it, you never in in your head you're, you're thinking oh, I can guarantee as a guarantee birdie coming up in the future, and when you get to it, you, it never works out like that because you've. You, you know, you, you've uh, you've projected yourself into the future. You're not present there. Yeah, and uh, that's exactly right. That's the pre-playing the future and uh, replaying the past, but pre-playing the future. And one of the things I like to say is, there are no easy holes or hard holes until you're done with them. Yeah, you may have, it may be a long par four, and you hit a driver and a and a, a hybrid or fairway wood, and you hit a great shot. And it rolls up and you tap uh, to a tap in distance and you tap in for birdie and you go, wow, that, that was the number one handicap hole. But boy, that, that wasn't hard. How on earth did and, I just burn And that? then you get on a short par four and, and you try to drive, drive close to the green and you hit it into the woods and you hit a tree coming out and you end up taking a triple bogey and you go, that was really hard. Yeah. Which so is, you uh, never know if it's an easy hole or a hard hole until you're done with it. I mean, the, the the classic definition, what you just said right there, is it's like, uh, well, that is, I'd say it's like an ego, um, the ego stepping in on that moment. and uh, That's right. You, you've let go of it at one instance and then you've you've empowered it the next. Um, it's, yeah, no, it's fascinating. Um, I want to be grateful of your, your time, Dr. Joe. So um, I've, I know we've got some uh, sort of these rapid fire questions to sort of... Sure. Um, so... Uh, what is what is what is the one book or, or or maybe several books that you've gifted the most? Uh, uh, maybe apart from yours, because I'm sure you you gift yours as well. Um, uh, oh well, you know, I you you asked me that, and I prepared my answer, and uh, as my as my books, which I've, are um, Zen Golf, yeah. is the is and and this new one, the Winnie the Pooh book, the um, and. You know, if people go to uh, my author page on Amazon, you can see all my books. But the Winnie the Pooh book, um, and I want to tell you something exciting about that in relation to Jack and Barbara Nicholas. So don't don't let me forget to tell you that. And then the third one is, uh, uh, it's an art book that I wrote <clears throat> and w- uh, with illustrations by Anthony Ravielli, the uh, artist who did the Hogan book. Yes. I met the, a gentleman who had purchased the rights to all of his drawings. So it's called Golf, the Art of the Mental Game. And it's a hundred of my tips with a hundred of the Ravielli drawings. And it's really a beautiful work of art. Oh, wow. I definitely have to include that in the, the show notes. And then, and then uh, that I've given uh, other than that would be one of my Buddhist teacher's books called Meditation in Action. Okay. And when did you read this, or when did it impact your sort of life? Um, well, the the books that affected my life. The first Buddhist book I wrote, I read, was called "The Way of the White Clouds," and it was uh, about uh, Tibet. And it was, it was half travel log and half meditation instruction book. And it was it really, as I read it, I said, "That makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense." Oh. I already think that, already think that, already think that. And at the end of the book, I said, what do you know? I, I'm a Buddhist, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> um, the other is, uh, um, uh, as I said, meditation in action. Yep. Uh, and, and, I, and I refer a lot to Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by uh, Suzuki Roshi, a Zen teacher who was a close friend of my, my Tibetan Buddhist teacher, Trigyam Trungpa. Um, recently, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, Peace is Every Step, is really a wonderful book as well. Okay, wonderful. That's uh, 
that there's a lot of lot of reading material there for the listeners to dive in. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, what is the one one purchase of a hundred dollars or less that has most positively impacted your life in the last six months? Tricks on yellow golf ball. Um, and here's the interesting thing from a psychology point of view: it reduces the time you spend with anxiety on the golf course because you can see it from farther away. So you know where your ball is and you're not worried about it if you were on the edge of the rough or, <laughs> or maybe in the rough and you, it, it's easier to find. So believe it or not, um, it, just as in, in tennis, uh, they all use yellow optic yellow golf balls because they're easier to see. In golf, this, the yellow golf ball is easier to see in, in the distance. And, um, and I get uh, um, Foot Joy, a uh, friend of mine is a, uh, um, a rep for Foot Joy, and um, I get slacks from him, and they're fabulous. So those are my two, two latest things. But um, so that's my, that's my purchases. Amazing. That's a good recommendation. I never thought of the yellow golf ball like that, but uh, um, it, it does make sense. Um, 10 seconds earlier, you know where it is, and that saves you 10 seconds of anxiety. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, last one or penultimate one. In the last five years, what new belief or behavior or habit has most improved your life? And this could be on the golf course or off the golf course related. Well, this is something that I, I do uh, corporate speaking on and keynote, keynote speaking in a concept that I've come up with called the four kinds of yes and no. And it has to do with honesty and integrity. And that is uh, the combination of yes and no in terms of commitment and follow through. Okay. Yes, I, yes, I will do something. And you make a commitment to do something or to meet someone at a particular time or to pr or produce something. And then the question is, did you follow through on that? So the four kinds of yes and no are yes, I did. Uh, yes, I, I will do this. And yes, I did. That works. The second is, no, that's not something I can provide, so there's no expectation. Third is, no, it's not something I can do. Things change, and yes, I actually can take care of that. that that's always positive. The only problem is the fourth one. Yes, I will. No, I didn't. So uh, the principle is very simple. Uh, use your mindfulness to reduce the number of yes, no's, and you will have better relationships. Okay. And that's going to be, that's going to be, that's a, a book that I'm working on right now called the four kinds of yes and no. And how did you come, uh, how would you come up to this? Like what was the, the sort of backstory? Um, it, it's really, it's really thinking about honesty and integrity in relationships uh, and and working with, uh, I do a lot of executive coaching with business people, mm -hmm. uh, and and keynote speaking, and and hearing from them and saying really, it, it's when things are promised and unfulfilled that it pr creates the most difficulty. I take it even back further to one of my Buddhist teachers who said. No appointments, no disappointments. <laughs> but if you make an appointment, fulfill that appointment. Right, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I, I always think personally on a, a big a big thing uh, I find with relationships um, is, is always the small things of, of being completely honest and transparent about. Uh, and I think there's the small things where it could just be like... Um, uh, you know what, what have you been up to today and you just make like a, a false excuse or a false lie saying I was uh, you know I was extremely busy when you weren't extremely busy for example and it's it's just complete transparency and, and honesty with whoever you're with uh, whenever you're with and just yeah I, I would say I would say that's true un, unless it's something that would cause more harm okay you can be diplomatic you know, and uh, um, uh, and it, there are certain times when you can be careful with your words and and not say something 
you see here, the, the trick that happens when you talk about complete transparency and honesty is some people use that as a way to um, vent their anger and get things off their chest. Yes. Uh, and they might say, you know, I think you were a real jerk. I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest with you. When uh, and, they as an ex- for as, as a, for example. Uh, when, when, you know, you don't know what that person's story is, so before you judge them, maybe wait and find out the whole story. Mm. You don't have to spout out your feelings about everything, uh, especially if you don't know the backstory. So that that that's a little bit, you know that that's uh, you have to temper your honesty with kindness. Yeah. No, I I, I can see that. Okay. I mean, well, I look forward to reading the book and diving into that more. Um, please, please uh, let me know when that's out, and I can ping it to the listeners as well. Um, I forgot. Well, to, sorry, carry on. Yeah, go. I go for it. Sorry. One thing. Yeah. One thing that people can do, uh, if uh, I I offer a uh, uh, free quote of the week from my from my books, a golf quote and then a life quote. Um, so so people are welcome to go to zengolf.com and sign up for that, and then they'll also get an announcement of any new things that are coming out. Okay, great. I, I'll include that. Um, thank you. So I, I forgot to just recap on the Jack Nicholas and the Winnie uh, the Pooh book. Oh, yes. Thank you for remembering that. Um, uh, I've known Jack and Barbara, mostly Barbara, of going to tournaments and watching Jack play um, for, for 20 years now. So when the Winnie the Pooh book came out, I sent a copy to her and she said she loved it and she keeps it in her bag when she travels. So I realized that they are big sponsors of children's health. <clears throat> and they have a Nicholas Children's Health Foundation and the Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. So I asked Disney and they were very generous to donate over 300 copies of the Winnie the Pooh book, A Walk in the Wood, Meditations on Mindfulness <clears throat> with a Bear Named Pooh. Uh, I told them there were 309 beds in the hospital. However many they could donate would be great. And they sent 320 books. Wow. So uh, kudos to Disney for doing that. And I also offered, when Barbara can be there, I will fly out to Miami from California and read to the children from the book. And uh, cause I recorded the audio book, including all of the animals voices, which was a lot of fun. So that's my connection with golf and the Winnie the Pooh book through, uh, Jack and Barbara Nicholas. Ah, that's amazing. Uh, well, many congratulations on, on, on that. And, uh, what a great cause for Disney as well. And, and, and all the books, to the kids, that's, I think you guys, you guys do that. You do a great job with things like that in America. Um, very much. Thank you. England can take a, a big note from, I think. Um, so, yeah, that's that's great to hear. Um, so, uh, just to to finally wrap up, I know you've got this personal action challenge that uh, something which you deeply believe in, which we ask every guest um, to sort of. Uh, give to the listeners as a, as a personal action challenge. Um, so please feel far away. Well, I think that it, it starts with mindfulness and that is, uh, to take a few minutes, uh, sit quietly <clears throat> and you can get, um, from almost any of my books, some instruction on, uh, mindfulness of working with your breathing, working with your thoughts and feelings and letting them come and go and develop awareness of them rather than them taking you over. What that produces is it gives you the space in your experience to respond to what is happening rather than react to what is happening. And there's a saying that there's just so much that you can control of what happens to you, but you can control completely how you respond to what happens to you. Mm. So that's the key for that. And again, uh, the four kinds of yes and no, be aware of your honesty and integrity in making and fulfilling commitments. 
uh, and apply mindfulness to that and just notice. You know, I, I have something that I call the ninja system of necessary intention and non-judgmental awareness. And, and that's the action challenge, to apply the ninja system. Notice, make a, make a positive intention of something that you want to cultivate or something you want to refrain from in your habits. And then notice just how many times you either do or don't do that particular habit uh, without judging yourself. Just count them. That's necessary intention and non-judgmental awareness. And you will notice how your habits move in the direction of your intention, little by little, but it does happen. Well, I uh, I hope all the listeners had a notepad and pen and paper for this episode because there's uh, an awful lot of uh, extremely valuable content you've, you've given us here today, which is very grateful for. So, Well, thank you. Uh, no, thank you very much, um, Dr. Joe. Um, so um, where can people find you? And I think you've mentioned it a couple of times um, and maybe reach out to you if they want to find their books. Where's, where's the best place to go? If you're okay. Well, the, the two main things are the, my um, general website, which is drjoeparent.com, just D-R-J-O-E-P-A-R-E-N-T.com, and also zengolf.com one word, Z-E-N-G-O-L-F dot com. Um, you can pretty much get to all my social media and everything from from those. Uh, the Zengolf app, you'll also see on those, but you can go to the app store at Apple or Google Play. And uh, and I mentioned my author page on Amazon.com, but, but the websites will also send you there uh, to find... Uh, the books. My my last three books were not on golf. There's Zen Tennis. There's the best diet book ever, The Zen of Losing Weight, and the Winnie the Pooh book, A Walk in the Wood, Meditations on Mindfulness with a Bear Named Pooh. Um, the Zen Golf and my other three golf books are, are all there as well. So zengolf.com or drjoeparent.com should t- take care of everything. And if people would like to book me for um, – keynote for speaking engagements for lessons i do lessons as we're doing this on skype with skype facetime zoom whatsapp i do lessons all over the world um it's like being in the same room as we have experienced being in the same room with each other yeah no I will, uh, i'll include all of those so f- thank you very much and i think anyone working view be a would be extremely valuable um joe thank you so much for your time this was your uh a real honor, as, as I said, it was um, a real game changer reading your, your book when I was at college. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, it's good to sort of recap almost sort of eight years later uh, of, of, of you know, coming across your work. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Chris. You did a great job interviewing. And please let me know if there's anything else I can do for you. That's very kind. Okay, we'll speak soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Cheers, Dr. Jim. Mm-hmm.